Welcome to the second in the series a Personal Tutor Guide to SPSS 19. In this second session we'll be focusing in more detail on what you need to do to set up a data file for the first time and how you would enter data. If this is the first presentation you've seen of this particular series, um, you may want to go back and check the first session in this series which introduces you to the basics of using SPSS and the various windows you'll need to open and what they look like. However, if you feel you're comfortable enough with SPSS and are ready to go ahead, let's have a look at what's going to be taking place in this session and the various things we're going to cover. As you can see here, we're going to be covering a number of different elements relating to data entry in SPSS. First, we're going to briefly review the statistical theory you'll need to know before you're ready to view the rest of this presentation. And then we're going to look at a variety of different topics, including naming variables, uh, how to deal with missing data, and how to set up uh, variable labels. As always, the last step will be a series of activities for you to complete on your own while pausing the presentation before playing the rest of the presentation to see somebody walk you through the answers. This series, the Personal Tutor Series Guide to SPSS, is designed as support for using SPSS, not as a method of learning statistics. What that means is that, although we're happy to walk you through every element of using SPSS and the various features and menus, we won't be covering some of the statistical theory that you'll need to know before you can actually use SPSS. For example, um, in this presentation, we've listed here on the slide some of the things that you'll need to know in order to make sense of the data we're entering and some of the settings we're going to be exploring on SPSS. There won't be time to cover these theoretical issues in this presentation. And so before you go any further, we recommend that you read a relevant chapter in a statistics textbook in order to familiarize yourself with the key concepts theoretical concepts that you're going to come across today, such as the different design types between and within, different types of variables, interval, ordinal, nominal, and how levels of data might work or why data might need to be labelled. Once you've read up on these areas and feel that you're comfortable enough with the statistical theory, then you're ready to view the rest of this presentation. We still recommend that you make a note of any term or concept within the presentation you don't understand so that afterwards you can read up on those terms online or in a relevant statistical test. Okay, so we're ready to get started with the first actual element of SPSS we're going to deal with in this session. Specifically, we're going to look at how you name variables in SPSS and also how you identify them as one of the particular variable types. In order to do this, and you'll see this in the next slide, we're just going to give you a, a sample study, a hypothetical uh, research study that someone is carrying out to use to illustrate the various different features that we're going to uh, show you in a few minutes. Now, this study is taken from the area of psychology, but really it could stand in for any study in almost any area of the social sciences that you might be involved in. Right, so as you can see in this study, the researchers are interested in looking at the relationship between three different variables. Um, they're looking at people's height as measured in inches. They're looking at their shoe size using UK shoe size measurements. And they're looking at the distance that these people live from campus. So these are all students that are taking part in this study. You can see that essentially it's a within participant design which means that each person is being measured on all three variables. And um, you can see that the three variables in question, as I said, are height, shoe size, and distance. Now, what we're interested in is how do we identify three variables in SPSS? How do we give them the appropriate names that they uh, have here? One thing we might want to keep an eye on is that some of the names are rather large, at least they are in the study. And how are we going to work with that when we actually start naming them in SPSS? The other thing to be aware of is the different types of variables we're dealing with here. So height is an interval variable, shoe size is an ordinal variable, and distance is also an interval variable. So let's see how you enter those variables, uh, identify them in SPSS, and identify the variable type. 
Right, so here we are looking at SPSS. Uh, specifically, we're looking at the data view window, which is where we would actually be inputting the data once we're ready. But we're not ready yet. The first thing we need to do is to name and identify the type of each of the variables that we're going to be entering data for. To do that, we go down to the variable view tab, which is down here in the bottom left hand corner, and click on it. So now we're looking at the variable view window. Here we can see each row is a, vari is a variable and We've got three variables to identify, so we'll start with the first row, type, click on the little box under name and call it height. Now when I press return you'll see that it fills in default values for all the other or most of the characteristics for that variable. These are the values it'll put in without you even asking, just as the standard values for those different characteristics, unless you tell it otherwise. So the only characteristic we want to focus on now, other than name, is the type of data we're dealing with. Now, don't be fooled by the column here marked type. This is not the column we want to change if we want to change the variable type as we would see it. To do that, you scroll over using this scroll bar here at the bottom of the window. Um, just drag it over. And then you'll see that it's got... Uh, a characteristic known as measure. If you click on that, or click on unknown at the moment, it'll bring up three options for the different type of data you're using. Either scale, which is essentially another way of describing interval data, ordinal for ordinal data, and nominal for nominal data. So height is an, basically an interval data, so we choose scale, and now that variable is set up correctly in terms of its name and the data type. So it's scroll backwards, dragging the scroll bar over again to the second variable. Now this one is called shoe size, or at least that's the name it's got in the study. So let's try typing in shoe size. Now, what you'll see there is that if I try to type in shoe size, two words, um, I get an error message saying you can't do that. This is for the simple reason that SPSS will not allow you to use certain characters, certain things in a variable name. And one of the things it won't allow you to use is a space. So I'm going to have to change the name to something that doesn't have a space in it. So I'll click on OK to get rid of the error message. I'll click on the box again to type in a new name. And this time I'll type in shoe size, but as one word. And this time, no problems. It accepts that. So if I scroll over again using the scroll bar at the bottom and I'm going to identify this variable. Well, we saw in the sample study that shoe size is ordinal. So if I click on measure and I then go down to ordinal, select that. I've now identified what type of variable we're using. Scroll back over and now we've got our third variable. So I'm clicking on the box in the third row. And this one is called distance from campus. Now, I could type in distance from campus, all one word, in the same way I did shoe size, all one word. But that sort of system of naming variables can become a bit cumbersome as longer and longer names make for more and more of a mouthful. Um, so one thing I might do is just abbreviate it to a single word. So instead of distance from campus, I'll just put in distance. Now, in case I was ever in a study where I'm measuring several diff different types of distance and I want to be clear about which one of the distances this one is measuring, I can give a more complete description of the name of the variable here in label. This is a box that just allows me to put in a more complete description using spaces or any characters I want of what that variable is measuring. So I can put in distance from campus here. What that means now is when SPSS is creating outputs, it will use the label distance from campus uh, to show that variable instead of the actual variable name. The variable name is something it will only use itself when it's doing its calculations. It'll always show the label to me. So having named my variable, and I now also have to indicate what type of data I'm dealing with. So again, I click on the box under measure and I select scale. 
And there we have it. I've now named and identified my three types of variables. I'm ready to actually um, input the data. To do that, I go down here to the bottom left hand corner and type data view or click on data view. And you can now see that the three variables have appeared on the screen. So I'm going to um, input the data. So to do that, I click on this first row here for height and I type in the data. So based on the data that was in the uh, screen you saw before this presentation or this part of the presentation, I'm just filling in the data. So in each case I'm typing in the number that was in the row and then just pressing down to move down to the next box. So we have 12 people in our study and those are their heights in inches. So if I go back up to shoe sizes, now I input the shoe sizes. Okay, I'm going to click on this box here at the top on the first row, so the first participant and the third column, which is the distance that they live away from campus. This person lives a long way away from campus, 300 miles. Next one is rather closer. Now this third person hasn't given us any answer to that question, so I'm going to leave that square blank for the moment. I'll come back to it later. So I'll fill in all the other squares that I have, each cell rather, not uh, with the response the person gave on their questionnaire. And there we are. So there you can see the basic example of how to name and identify variable type and then type in the data for those three variables. Um, now let's move on to look at the next thing which is how do you deal with uh, variable width and how do you deal with missing data. In this step we're going to look at how you deal with two elements of setting up your data file. One is how you identify the width of your variable and the other is how you tell the computer to deal with missing data. Um, the width of a variable represents how many digits that that variable could possibly ha contain. So how big a number is it going to be. Um, it also, as you'll see, deals with the question of how many uh, points of decimal place are you recording. So are you recording whole numbers or how many decimal digits will you include. This is mostly a cosmetic thing, making your data easier to read. The other question, how you deal with missing values, is more important. Sometimes your participants will forget to fill in a question or sometimes they'll simply refuse to answer one and this will leave you with gaps in your data. Unfortunately, computers are very bad at dealing with gaps, so you need to find something to sort of label that gap as missing data so the computer will understand why there isn't uh, a regular number there. So let's remind ourselves of the study we're doing three variables we're comparing or looking at the relationship between the three of them are height, shoe size and the distance the person lives away from campus. Now in terms of the width of these variables let's look at each, three, each one of them to determine how big the variable might be. Well in terms of height it's very likely that this is going to be a two-digit variable since it's unlikely you'll have somebody whose height is shorter than um, 10 which is 10 inches it's possible, although very unlikely, you'll get someone whose height is over 99 inches, which would make it a three-digit variable. So we'll say three digits, or three uh, digits in width, is probably the most likely setup for that. Shoe size is at most going to be a two-digit variable. And distance, in terms of miles, could be anything from one mile to thousands of miles. So we might want to make that a four-digit variable. Um, we have one piece of missing data. Uh, the third participant hasn't told us how far they live away from campus. So we're going to have to find something to put in that gap, which will tell the computer this isn't a number, this is just something standing in for missing data. So let's see how we do both of those things. Here we are back with our data again. Um, at the moment, you can see that for each of the variables, we're showing them up to two decimal places. This is redundant, it's not needed, because none of the variables measure any kind of fractions. 
So if we go to variable view, we're going to change that. So we click on the variable view tab, uh, scroll the scroll bar over to the left hand side. You can see two columns here, width and decimals. So at the moment, the default values for those are eight and two. So uh, a width of eight digits with two decimal places. So let's get rid of the decimals first. So click on decimal and press the down arrow to reduce that to a zero. You can click on the second one. Now instead of using up and down, you can simply highlight the number and type zero on the keyboard, which will also get rid of it. Or you can copy and paste, normally that works, to get rid of um, the two decimal places with the zero decimal places. Now if we take a quick look back at the data view window, you'll see now we've gone from 66.00 and 62.00 to just 66 and just 62, which is much easier to read. The other thing you might want to do is to change the width, so go back, go back to variable view. We agreed that it was very unlikely someone would have a height of bigger than 99 inches, but we'll play it safe and give a maximum width of three digits. For shoe size, there is I don't think there is a shoe size bigger than 99, so the maximum width of a shoe size measurement is going to be two digits, probably 12 or 15 or 18. And then the maximum width for distance, well, it could be anything up to thousands of miles. So we'll give a width of four digits, which can measure everything from one to 9,999. If you go back to data view, you'll see this hasn't changed what you're seeing by much, but it should um, help your data be cosmetically cleaner in other areas, like in terms of the reports that SPSS will produce later on. So it's usually a good idea to try and clean up your data definitions in this way. Now, returning to the variable view, we need to come up with a way of telling the computer how to deal with missing values. So um, there's only one of our variables which has a missing value, and that's distance. So we'll click on the box for missing on the distance variable, and you can see by clicking on the box, this little blue square with three dots has appeared in it. This tells us there's a pop-up window we can access, so we click on the blue box and up pops the window to help us define or give a, a number to represent a missing value. So whatever number we pick to put in here, the computer won't treat it as a real number, they'll simply treat it as a little sign saying there's missing data here. So we want to pick a number that couldn't possibly naturally appear anywhere in our data set for that variable. We want to pick a number that's impossible. To do that, we click on discrete missing values, which allows us to, to identify up to three different numbers to represent uh, missing data in this variable. And since distance could be any number, any positive number from 1 to 9,999, we can't choose any of those numbers since it might conflict with the real piece of data we get. So instead, let's put in a number we can't get for distance, which is a minus number. I'm going to put in minus 1. So nobody's going to put minus 1 as their answer. It's impossible to be a minus number of miles away from anything. So the computer will know that every time I put in that number, I'm indicating a missing piece of data. I click on OK. And now the computer knows that for the variable distance, every time it sees a minus 1, it's dealing with missing data. I go back to data view again by clicking on the data view tab in the bottom left hand corner. I click on this cell here which represents the distance score for that third participant and I type in minus one and now I have told the computer that particular value is missing data that the person didn't answer that question. And that's all you need to do in terms of identifying the width of your variables and also how to deal with missing data. In this next step, we're going to look at how you can label certain data or certain data values to help you remember what those values represent. One thing you need to remember is that with all computers, they prefer to work with numbers. Computers really struggle to work with anything that isn't a number. So although they seem to work very effectively with words, presenting them on screen or helping us to word process them, Really, there's a lot of stuff going on in the background to help them manage those things that aren't numbers. 
In the case of SPSS, SPSS has real difficulty in conducting any analysis which involves a variable that is measuring something that isn't numerical. The best example of this are nominal variables which measure categories. So things like uh, eye colour, nationality or what religion you are, these variables don't have numerical values. The way to get around this usually is to convert the non-numerical data into numbers which simply help you represent each of the groups. So for example, instead of putting in from religion, Hindu, Muslim, Catholic and Protestant, you simply put in group 1, group 2, group 3 and group 4. Uh, the numbers are only placeholders, something to represent a particular group. But of course, after you've done this a number of times, it can be very difficult to remember which number represents which group. So when you're looking back over your data and you see religion and you see group 3 and group 4, it can be hard to remember, was group 3 Catholic or was group 3 Protestant? To help you do this, SPSS has a feature where you can attach labels to certain numbers to remind you what those numbers represent for that variable. Um, we're going to look at how this is done in relation to a new sample study which is going to involve that kind of data. In this sample study we've moved on from height and foot size and distance and this time we're looking at gender differences in interest in learning statistics. So we have two variables, one of which is gender, which is a nominal variable with two possible values, male and female, and the other variable is interest, which is um, an interval variable representing how interested they are in statistics. Now, because the nominal variable, gender, has non-numerical data, male and female, we're going to have to convert those into numbers, temporarily, at least for the purpose of SPSS, but we're also going to use SPSS's labeling feature to help us remember which number represents which. So it's completely arbitrary which numbers we choose. So I'm going to choose the number 1 to represent male and the number 2 to represent females. So let's have a look at how you'd input that into SPSS. Right, so we're back with the data window in SPSS and we want to input the data we've just seen from the sample study. But of course before we can do that we need to define our variables. So we'll go down to the variable view tab here, click on it to bring up the variable view window. We can now start defining our variables. So the first variable is going to be gender. I click on the name box there for the first row and type in gender. When we press return, it's going to fill in some default values for gender. We're going to modify a few of those. <coughs> gender can only have two possible values, one and two, so we don't need any decimals. And we can reduce the width down to one digit since it can only be a one digit number. Don't need a label since the name gender is pretty clear enough. Um, we don't have any missing values. And if we scroll over using the scroll bar here at the bottom, we can define this variable as nominal. Now the last thing we need to do, which is the new thing, which is to assign each number a value. You click on the values box here, which currently says none, and you'll now see a little blue square has appeared with three dots in it. You click on that and the value label windows appears. So I can now start inputting the values and indicating what label each value should have. So if I click on the value box and I input the value 1, I then click on the label box and I input the label male. You'll now see that the blue add button has become available, so if I click on that it saves that that value should be assigned that label. I click on the value box again and I type in value 2. I click on the label box and this time I type in female. Oh, uh, it would help if I spelt it correctly. There we go, and I add it, and there we go, the second label has been assigned to the second value. I click on OK, and those values are now saved for that variable, and they'll only be applied to that variable. So I need to do my second variable, so I scroll across the scroll bar here at the bottom, and this variable is interest. Um, like gender, I know a few things about the variable which allows me to sort of tidy up some of the default values, so I know there are no decimal values for this variable. I also know there's only five possible values, one, two, three, four, and five, all of which are one digit in width, so I can set the width to one digit. And if I scroll over using the scroll bar at the bottom, I can indicate that this variable is a scale variable, also known as an interval variable. 
Uh, for those of you who really know your stats, that choice may seem a bit controversial, but for everybody else, don't worry about it. It's something you can get into a lot later in your stats career. So now that I've defined my two variables, it's time to start entering my data. To do that, I go into the Data View tab here to bring back up the data window. And you can now see the two variables I've just defined have appeared there in the first and second column. First column is gender, second column is interest. So I can start inputting the gender data. So I know that the first two participants in my study are female, so I can type in two for each of those. And as you can see, the computer automatically shows me the label, not the number. The third participant is a male, so that's a one, and the fourth participant is a female, so that's two. Then we've got two males, um, a female, two males again, two females, and another male. Now, one handy thing about the fact that it shows you the label is that if you type in anything incorrectly, as I've done there with number nine, hitting one twice instead of once, uh, it shows up as a number because there isn't any label associated with the number 11. So I know I've made a mistake there, so I can go back up, just type one, and it will replace it, and now all my data is incorrectly. Now, the other thing is, if you want to remind yourself of which number each label is attached to, there's a quick button which will do that. Up in the top right hand corner, this button which shows you um, a branching fork with one branch leading to the number one and the other branch leading to the letter A. If you click on that a few times, you'll notice that the labels appear and disappear for any variable that has those labels. And it helps you remind yourself, OK, let's see, number two is female and number one is male. Now I'm ready to put in the rest of my data. This is going to be a lot simpler. so. I just type in again the scores each person got on their interest measure. And um, one more four. So there we are. All the data is now entered, and the gender variable has been correctly labeled so I can see what the two numbers represent in terms of which gender is which number. At this point, we've introduced you to all the basics of uh, data entry and defining your own variables, so it's time for you to practice putting some of those basic principles into action by completing these activities. Uh, on the screen now, you'll see two activities, both based on hypothetical studies or surveys that people might do, and each one requiring you to create a fresh new data file, define your variables, input the data. Um, to do that, we suggest you pause the presentation, open SPSS, do it for yourself, and then get as far as you can, or when you think you've successfully completed, play the presentation again to see somebody walk you through the correct answers. Um, so if you're ready, please pause the presentation now. If you're hearing this, hopefully you've completed the activities and you're ready to see somebody walk you through the correct answers. In a minute now, we'll switch over to a video presentation of somebody going through each of these two examples so you can see how it's done. In the first hypothetical study, it was a soft drinks company who were trying to test two new fizzy drinks, which they simply label fizzy drink A and fizzy drink B. Now, one of the key things to notice about this study is that every person who participates in the study drinks both drinks, which means essentially it's a within-participants design. This is going to matter when it comes to how we um, present the data. So we go to Variable View, click on Variable View, and we can define our two variables as uh, fizzy A, so I'm going to type in, in, by clicking on the name box, I'm going to type in fizzy A, and it's uh, telling me, putting in all the default values. Uh, again, I can get rid of decimals because there's no decimal places, and the largest number in either fizzy drink score is two digits in width, so I'm going to set the width to two. There are no missing values, and um, I can set the score to be uh, scale. And for the second variable, I'm going to call this one fizzy B. 
again we get the standard values which I'm going to change to be the same as the ones I put in for Fizzy A. So we're done now, we've defined our two variables, given them names, inputted the correct values, and now we're ready to input the data itself. So I can put in the scores pretty much as we saw them on the test sheet instead I guess they're going down instead of across. And then their score on the second variable. And there you have it. So that's how your data should look if you've done that first example correctly. You may have chosen slightly different variable names to me, but the basic layout, and if I just click on the variable view window again, you can see the basic settings should be as you see them here. Right, so let's move on now to the second example. So to do that, I'm just going to open a new data window. Okay, so this time if I go to, if I look at the, think of the study, it's a study looking at the size of people's feet and how accurately they kick a ball. Now this time I, I know it's a between subjects design because you have um, different people in each group so that no person appears in both groups. It's impossible that some would have big feet and little feet at the same time. So I go to variable view and I'm going to need to define my first variable as uh, foot size. Um, and this is going to have two possible values, either big or little. So I can, a bit like gender, I can set the width down to one digit. And I can set the measure to be nominal. And I'm going to need to input values, so I click on the values box here, click on the blue box with the dots. I'm going to put in the value 1 to be uh, large feet. I click on add, I then click on value again, and I click on label, and I put in small feet. And click on OK, and I've now labeled those values. So I click on the box up here for the name of the second variable and this is going to be their score and if I press return again this is a number between 1 and 9 so I can reduce the decimals to 0 and reduce the width to 1 because there's only, they're all one digit numbers and if I scroll over and select the measure set it to scale I'm now ready to en enter my data so I go back to data view now there are 10 people in each group, so I can put in 10 people with foot size 1 and 10 people with foot size 2. I go back up to the top to start inputting the scores. So the scores for all the people with large feet are as follows. This is how it appears in the data file or in the data on the slide if you want to flip back and have a look at it. And there you have it. And so that's how your data should look if you've created the correct data file and inputted it correctly for that second example. Just to nip back to look at variable view, you can see that um, there's the names of the variables, that's the width and decimals. In the case of foot size, I've got two values, which look like this. And as I said before, you may have used slightly different names, but ultimately the layout should be the same. If you've managed to successfully complete those tasks and defining the variables and entering the data correctly, then you're probably ready to move on to the third presentation in this series. Um, third presentation focuses on descriptive analysis.
However, if there's anything here that you haven't understood or if you've struggled with the examples, then by all means, rewind this presentation, play it again, or play those sections again that you feel you're not quite sure on and do it until you feel you're comfortable that you know what you're doing.